met in 2021 when he was a dietetic intern, and I was so excited to continue working with him as he pursued graduate school. So a little bit more about Cole. Cole graduated summa cum laude from Oregon State University with a major in human nutrition, minors in both microbiology and writing, and a certificate in scientific, technical, and professional communications. During his time at OSU, he was awarded a scholarship from the OSU Retirement Association in 2020 for his future career promoting healthy aging of older adults. During his time at OHSU, he interned at the VA in Portland, successfully completed his dietetic internship and continued with coursework that included a partial focus on older adult nutrition. Cole shared, I find that older adults are in need of nutrition intervention, especially as the population continues to age. And one of the most effective ways to improve nutritional status is to train the trainer, essentially aligning well with the ideals of geriatric nutrition school. So Cole, I'm gonna hand it over to you. You got this. Thank you for that excellent introduction. So as Katie said, my name is Cole Theobald and I'm going to be presenting my capstone seminar on the development of a geriatric nutrition curriculum for caregivers of older adults. So just a little overview for this seminar presentation. First, I'm gonna start with my problem statement, then move on to our project goals, speak a little bit about the overview of organizations, and then get into a bit of background information, speaking a little bit about older adult nutrition and malnutrition, caregivers, and similar projects addressing the same topic. Then I'll talk about the project design itself, diving into the written content, a supplementary workbook that was developed, as well as additional materials. Lastly, I'll finish up with some conclusions of discussions of future directions, as well as a Q&A session at the very end. Our main problem is that our population is getting older. It's really good that we're living longer than we ever have before, thanks to advancements in medical science. But by 2034, it's projected that older adults over the age of 65 will be a greater proportion of the population than children under the age of 18 in America from the AARP. As the population ages and we have more and more older adults, that means we'll have more and more caregivers taking care of them. In 2015, there was an estimated 34 million unpaid caregivers who cared for an over, older adult over the age of 50. The average age for these caregivers is around 49 years old, and the majority of caregivers, whether they're paid or unpaid, care for a parent or grandparent or their spouse. A lot of this care is related to older adults' greater risk for developing chronic health conditions related to nutrition, as well as experiencing multiple comorbidities that may lead to increased disease burden and risk for malnutrition, which I'll be discussing in a little bit. Additionally, these caregivers have different levels of experience based off of their own personal path into caregiving or their own personal histories. Certified caregivers require basic nutrition training and at least six credits per year of continuing education in the state of Oregon, which could have a nutrition focus. Whereas caregivers who are taking care of their family and unpaid have no education requirements whatsoever. It's all about their own personal background. So then the goal of this project ultimately is that we're looking to improve older adult nutrition in a relatively novel way that's been historically underutilized in the past. Our project looks to empower caregivers with knowledge and skills related to nutrition, such that they're able to one, address nutrition related concerns, two, to find and utilize resources available to them related to nutrition, and three, to empower them to access the medical system where they may have otherwise been intimidated beforehand. This project was put up by the Geriatric Dietitian blog, which is run by Katie Dodd, owner and operator of Katie Dodd Nutrition LLC. She has a long resume and a history with the older adult population working in older adult nutrition. In addition to running the Dietitian Side Hustle, a blog site meant to help dietitians start their own businesses, as well as High Calorie Foods, a recipe blog that provides high calorie meal options for older adults and their caregivers, she also runs the Geriatric Dietitian blog. This is a blog platform with over 100,000 unique visitors per month, as well as through associated social media platforms. She's also a qualified host for this project's curriculum because she has 14 plus years of experience with older adult nutrition care. She's also a board certified specialist in geriatric nutrition, and in 2020, she won the Oregon Academy Outstanding Dietitian of the Year Award. And these are just a few of her many, many accolades. So getting into the background information of this seminar, I'm gonna be talking about older adult nutrition, 
caregiver specifics, as well as similar projects for caregiver education. And as I'm talking about older adult nutrition, I'm going to focus in on malnutrition, contributing factors related to age that help older adults develop malnutrition, and the disease malnutrition feedback cycle, as well as interventions that we can use to help prevent or reduce the burden of malnutrition. To get started, though, it's important to know about the mini nutritional assessment tool for older adults. This is a screening tool that's been validated in older adults above the age of 65. It helps to determine whether or not an older adult is at risk for developing malnutrition or if they're already potentially malnourished. A score of 24 to 30 indicates that an older adult likely has normal nutritional status. A score between 17 and 23.5 indicates that they might be at risk for developing malnutrition and a score below 17 indicates that they're likely already malnourished. Currently, a lot of research into older adult nutrition utilizes the MNA assessment tool to screen for malnutrition in older adults. Based off of MNA scores, it's been determined that approximately 50% of older adults, regardless of their care setting, whether that be in their home, uh, free living in the community, or in nursing-based care facilities, 50% of them are at risk for malnutrition. Within nursing home facilities, about 18% of residents are malnourished, according to the MNA screener, and about 9% of older adults on home-based care are screened as malnourished as well. There are a lot of separate contributing factors that can increase an older adult's risk for developing malnutrition. Uh, some of these include typical age-related changes like anorexia or aging or feeling a little less hungry as you get older. It could include age-related taste changes, as well as an increased risk for chronic disease. Unintentional weight loss can also lead to malnutrition, as can shifts in diet quality and feelings of social loneliness or isolation. Each of these can contribute directly or indirectly to malnutrition by decreasing an older adult's intake of food, uh, increasing their needs for nutrients like protein, calories, or micronutrients, or depleting their existing stores, whether through the inflammatory process or starvation. Diving a little bit deeper into the disease malnutrition feedback cycle, you'll start with a disease, whatever it might be. You can develop it or it might uh, progressively get worse. This can lead to an older adult decreasing their intake or increasing their needs for calories or protein. If these needs aren't met, they can then lead to unintentional weight loss, anorexia, any number of other factors that we discussed that might lead to the development of malnutrition. This malnutrition will decrease their ability to recover from their disease based off of their decreased stores of energy and more energy being spent on recovering the body from malnutrition itself as opposed to healing from the disease process. This can lead to the development of additional diseases or the worsening of current diseases, which can further exacerbate existing malnutrition, creating a downward spiral that will eventually lead to death. Fortunately, we know from extensive research that targeted nutrition interventions work in the older adult population. This could include providing oral nutrition supplements, interventions related to diet or exercise, or dietitian led interventions where one on one interviews motivate older adults or provide them knowledge and skills to better care for themselves nutritionally. Additionally, some small caregiver based interventions have been shown to be effective as well. Each of these types of interventions has shown improvement for older adults experiencing anorexia, uh, those who have experienced unintentional weight loss in the past or who have developed malnutrition, those who have chronic diseases currently that need management, and for those who have poor diet quality. Increasing appetite, gaining weight, managing diseases, and increasing the quality of diet were all related to lower risk of developing malnutrition, as well as the resolution of current malnutrition. However, one caveat to that is that nutrition interventions need to be initiated early in the process. When interventions are started too late, it's been shown that they have little to no effect and that the malnutrition disease feedback cycle has already begun and began to cycle a few times and is to a point where preventative and nutrition interventions as well as initial uh, initial treatments such as the oral nutrition supplements are not as effective. So it can be important to recognize the signs of worsening nutrition early so that interventions can be started before it's too late. And this is where caregivers can come into play. 
So now we're going to move on and get a little bit more specific on the caregivers. We're going to be talking about the training that they have to receive, benefits that nutrition knowledge can have for caregivers, as well as some interventions that have been shown to work in the past. There are, as I mentioned, two traditional pathways into caregiving. The first is to be a certified licensed caregiver. This will typically involve eight hours of basic training, as well as continuing education annually. In Oregon, this continuing education requirement is six or more continuing education credits per year, but the requirements can vary based on state. Additionally, these caregivers are paid for their work and they're able to go home at the end of the day. You can contrast this with the other pathway into caregiving, which is simply having a sick family member that needs to be taken care of. These caregivers are not necessarily trained. They're unpaid, typically. Uh, they have an increased burden of work based off of emotional attachment and interpersonal stress with the person that they're caring for. It can be difficult to care for somebody that you love, especially if you're watching them slowly develop malnutrition and worsen without knowing necessarily what you can do to help them out. Caregivers that do receive nutrition knowledge find a lot of benefits though, including a decrease in the day-to-day -day burden related to nutrition care, which could include uh, feeling like somebody's not eating enough or determining what the correct foods for somebody to eat are, whether for safety or for diet modifications. Additionally, older adults with adequate nutrition status are better able to participate in their own activities of daily living, such as showering, eating, and going to the bathroom, which can decrease the amount of care burden that a caregiver is experiencing at any given time. Because of these benefits to feelings of burden, it can also decrease the caregiver's feelings of stress about caregiving, and it can decrease their feelings of fatigue related to giving care to their older adult. We know that nutrition and education is successful for caregivers in improving their older adults' nutrition status. These interventions typically address preconceptions about food and nutrition and provide a caregiver with practical skills that they can use in their daily practice with their older adult. Older adults involved in these studies, which provided nutrition education to caregivers, had improved MNA scores, improved levels of protein and calorie intake, and improved intake of at-risk micronutrients such as folate, vitamin E, and polyunsaturated fatty acids, to name a few. There have been some similar projects that have addressed caregiver education on nutrition topics, including available courses for continuing education credits, as well as for self-guided learning. The continuing education credits related to nutrition that a caregiver can learn are extremely limited, in all honesty, all I could find based off of my brief review of what is available were four one-hour courses from careacademy.org, as well as one 20-minute course. These were related to nutrition overviews, generally speaking, and food preparation methods, as well as basic cooking skills, um, and how to modify diets to assist with things like difficulty chewing, kosher meal preparation, religious practices, cultural practices, etc. Courses themselves are specific to day-to-day -day skills, but they don't necessarily provide the why behind some of these practices. Additionally, they're very general in their scope and don't typically dive particularly deep into the nutrition science that somebody might be interested in as a caregiver. Self-guided resources on nutrition are sporadic for caregivers. The Administration for Community Living has some senior nutrition programs, as well as caregiver nutrition self-care help, but Nothing specifically tailored towards caregivers of older adults managing their older adults nutrition. Uh, additionally, the National Center for the Equitable Care of Elders put on by Harvard University has monthly podcasts related to care, but these are very rarely nutrition related. I would estimate approximately one or two every year or so. So if the landscape is relatively barren with resources and continuing education credits for caregivers related to nutrition and older adults, that's where we come in with the curriculum developed through this project for the Geriatric Nutrition School. In this next section, I'm going to discuss the design of this project in detail. We're going to get into the written content itself, including a marketing plan, as well as course content, including what's uh, included in specific modules. Uh, associated learning objectives related to those modules and question banks for the end of the modules. 
Additionally, we're going to discuss a supplementary workbook that was developed to go alongside the course content, as well as additional materials such as embedded resources and the back end budgeting sheet meant to be usable throughout the process of developing the school. The marketing plan that you see here on the left was developed as a traditional marketing plan. It includes the marketing mix, our objectives with our marketing plan, a competitive analysis of what's available currently, which I have discussed previously, a discussion of our target audience and how we might attract them to our course platform, a discussion of marketing content, and ways that we can monitor and evaluate the success of the course once it's released. To start, I just wanted to highlight the marketing mix. So our product is going to be an online video course utilizing the curriculum developed as part of this capstone project, focusing on caregivers of older adults to teach them nutrition knowledge and practical skills that they can use in their day to day living with their uh, practice and their older adults. The price for our product is going to likely be around 100 to 150 dollars per license. Um, this is uh, meant to attract caregivers who may not otherwise be able to afford extravagant class uh, classes online while still making a profit based on our assumed costs. Uh, this course will be hosted on an online learning platform such as Thinkific or Teachable, and the promotion for it will include common marketing practices such as email marketing, social media promotion on things like Facebook, uh, Pinterest, Instagram, or Twitter as well as blog promotion through the geriatric dietitian targeted, um, targeted advertisements on Google or social media, as well as word of mouth between caregivers and more options as we see fit. Diving a little bit deeper into our target audience reveals that the majority of caregivers are female. This is about 75%. About half of caregivers are between the age of 18 and 49 years old and 42% of them are caring for a parent. 35% uh, of them are 65 years or older themselves and are likely caring for their spouse. Targeting these audiences specifically can be challenging. We're not looking to necessarily attract female caregivers um, as there are such a large pro proportion of the population. And instead we're focusing on those between the ages of 18 and 49. Uh, even more specifically, perhaps between 30 and 50. A lot of these caregivers find online courses to be pretty easy to navigate as well as educational. Additionally, a lot of these adult learners are themselves self guided in their learning styles. So some of the additional content that we've created, like the self guided workbook will be especially useful to them. Additionally, I should note that we won't necessarily be targeting the 35% of caregivers that are 65 years or older. Um, these caregivers might find it more difficult or cumbersome to utilize an online platform for their learning. In order to effectively target this population, the modality of the course content would have to change to a more traditional form, um, like a book or perhaps an in-person class. Diving into the course content, from the beginning, Katie and I worked together to generate an overall curriculum that would cover the following topics listed on the left in eight modules that we'll discuss in more detail moving forward. Each of these modules are equipped with learning objectives, which I'll discuss briefly, and about six to seven overarching topics with related workbook questions, as well as a bank of questions associated with the modules that can assess for learning and recall. Additionally, there's in-text and end of module reference lists so that caregivers who are interested in learning a little bit more in depth about the sources could look through them themselves. So this is an example of what the curriculum looks like in its form as it exists now. The learning objectives are stated at the top with the course content that follows. Um, most sections and their subsections start out with an introduction that segues into the following topic and the modules themselves have introductions that will address what we'll be talking about throughout the entirety of the, the module. So getting into module one, Geriatric Nutrition 101, we wanted to include general recommendations for all adults, including older adults, such as those from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, as well as some general examples of healthy diets like plant-based diet or Mediterranean diet styles. We'll then dive into special needs for older adults, such as nutrients of concern like fiber, protein, vitamin B12, as well as fluids, and the possibility that an older adult might have a feeding tube. 
Additionally, we get into typical nutrition related issues for older adults, including unintended weight loss, taste changes, and a loss of appetite, like I mentioned previously. From there, we move into a general health overview, including some of the most common conditions that an older adult might face, as well as how dietitians might intervene for some of these common conditions. We also briefly discuss physical activity and the benefits of exercise. Uh, additionally, we'll discuss medications, including common meds that an older adult might be taking, as well as a discussion of nutrition related side effects and when to contact their pharmacist about concerns for polypharmacy. We round out the section with a discussion on treating older adults with respect, including uh, incorporating cultural practices surrounding food, as well as incorporating cultural foods into their diet. Next, we move into our discussion on preventing unintended weight loss in module two. Here, we really get into what malnutrition is and how it might be spotted. We talk about why an older adult might be feeling a lower appetite, as well as some interventions that can help to stimulate appetite, such as including foods that they prefer, uh, regular mealtime schedules, and involving older adults in the process of cooking a meal, which we'll talk further about in a later module. This also includes a discussion about the density of food, including nutrient and calorie density, as well as ways that you can increase the density of certain foods by increasing their calorie content. We talk about ways to select recipes and how they might include more calories in a normal way that doesn't necessarily interfere with the meal as it typically is. We also include a discussion on oral nutrition supplements, including some of their pros and cons, and how someone might be able to make a sort of oral nutrition supplement at home. Additionally, we provide a high calorie meal plan exchange list sort of that goes over breakfast, lunch, dinner and snacks and talks about how swapping some things like skim milk for whole milk or, for example, increasing the amount of gravy that goes on to a meatloaf dinner can improve an older adult's calorie intake. Lastly, we talk about a little bit about ease of eating and oral pain as it relates to nutritional status, which serves as a segue into the next module. So in module three, chewing and swallowing, we talk a little bit about oral health, hygiene, hydration status, and the ways that nutrition plays into oral health. We also talk about types of dentures and their typical care, as well as discussions on oral pain, what might cause it, and ways that it can be reduced while eating. Additionally, we talk about dysphagia, including the role of the speech language pathologist and their importance for diagnosing dysphagia, and a short discussion on the stages of dysphagia as defined by the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative, or IDSI. We also talk about what to do if somebody starts to choke and when the Heimlich maneuver is or is not appropriate to perform. We also talk about changing diet texture in this section. Uh, what foods might be the most palatable as an altered texture, as well as how to thicken liquids with food science, like, for example, using cornstarch. Additionally, we talk about choosing specific foods that would be easier to eat, such as soft or no chew foods, as well as more liquidy foods to benefit hydration status. Then in module four, we move into a discussion about maximizing meal times. This is sort of a dual purpose module of sorts that talks both about social health as it relates to nutrition, as well as appetite. To start, we talk about social health and feelings of loneliness, as well as socioeconomic status, and how each of these can relate to nutritional status in older adults. We also talk about food and mealtimes and how food culture plays into social aspects of eating. This module also discusses how it might look to increase uh, an older adult's involvement in mealtime practices, including, uh, including them in planning meals, uh, shopping together, or if it's safe to do so, even cooking together. We also talk about service styles and how they might impact nutrition, as well as the inclusion of adaptive eating equipment. We also talk about certain aspects that may make it more difficult for an older adult to get all of the nutrition that they need throughout the day, focusing largely on appetite, but instead of sim stimulating appetite, as we discussed in module two, module four focuses on working with appetite, um, maximizing the amount of calories that an older adult eats when they're actually feeling hungry. Additionally, we talk about taste changes and what might cause them, as well as some ways to modify flavor so that an older adult finds food more appetizing to eat generally. 
we also end this discussion in this module talking about dementia and some ways that mealtimes might need to be altered for those with dementia to make sure that they're eating enough food. Next, our discussion in module five centers largely around bowel health. So we briefly go into the digestive tract, explaining what all the parts of it are, as well as how separate sections might change with age. For example, we have a discussion on how the stomach change, uh, decreased acid production and decreased intrinsic factor production can lead to a difficulty in getting enough vitamin B12 in an older adult's uh, diet. We talk about the role that fiber plays in digestive health, as well as some of its numerous benefits as, and ways to increase the amount of fiber that an older adult is eating throughout the day. We couple this with a discussion on the importance of fluids and hydration status, generally, as well as how it relates to fiber and how it relates to bowel health. We also talk about common bowel problems, including diarrhea, constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, and colorectal cancer as well as how food and nutrition can play a role in some of these issues. We also briefly touch on food safety in this section, as well as a special topic of interest for me personally, the human microbiome and how the diet and the microbiome interplay. Then we get into the longest module in the course curriculum, Common Medical Conditions Overview. In this section, I talk about 10 fairly common nutrition-related conditions that an older adult is likely to face, including chronic kidney disease, heart disease, dementia, type 2 diabetes, cancer, strokes, chronic lower respiratory diseases, including infections and COPD, uh, dysphagia, urinary tract infections, as well as infections on a general scale, as well as osteoporosis. For each of these conditions, this section goes into nutrition implications, as well as how to manage conditions using diet related to what dietitians might typically say to a caregiver of an older adult or an older adult themselves who are managing this condition. Lastly, this section has a short discussion on ways to manage malnutrition while including diet restrictions and when it might be appropriate to talk to a dietitian or a doctor about the liberalization of an older adult's diet if they're not eating enough. The last two modules are focused on nutrition at the end of life, as well as resources and referrals for caregivers. In the nutrition at the end of life module, we discuss what the end of life actually looks like, when it is, and the difficulties that a caregiver might experience in navigating the end of their caree's life. We discuss the difference between palliative and hospice care as well as when an older adult might be more likely to be placed in one or the other. We also talk about dying, relating it to hunger and thirst and the process of decreasing hunger and thirst responses at the end of life. This segues well into a discussion about food fights and lays out some food rules about the role of the caregiver and the role of the older adult when it comes to food at the end of life. We also briefly touch on the emotional burden of nutrition at the end of life and how important it is to check in on oneself and ways to reassure caregivers that they're, what they're doing is difficult and that they're doing it as well as they can. Lastly, we talk about how best to take care of their older adults, as well as how best to take care of themselves. Their own mental health, physical health, and nutrition are all equally important, especially as it relates to having enough energy to well care for their older adult at the end of their life. In the last module, uh, resources and referrals, uh, this ends our course curriculum. We discuss some senior nutrition programs that can be utilized like SNAP, um, CHCFP, or the Child and Adult Care Food Program, or CSFP, or the Commodity Supplemental Food Program, as well as eligibility for these programs and when somebody might look into applications. We also talk about the benefit of food pantries, as well as other ways to increase access to food, such as utilizing meal delivery services or grocery delivery services. We also get into meal planning in this section. There are three example meal plans, including a high calorie meal plan, a diabetes meal plan that focuses on carb restrictions, um, as well as a soft food diet for somebody who's struggling with dysphagia, but that still contains adequate protein and calories. 
We also talk about strategies for making your own meal plan in this section. We talk about supplements as well as some resources that caregivers can use to look into supplements that their older adults might be taking or might be interested in taking. Uh, similar resources for food and drug interactions, as well as a discussion of common interactions, uh, such as grapefruit, alcohol, or dairy products. Um, it includes some resources on exercise from the National Institute of Aging, as well as how to look into community-based activity programs where they're located themselves. We end our course content entirely with a discussion on how to find a dietitian in order to get caregivers in contact with dietitians to any, answer any more of the questions that they have, as well as to provide more in-depth knowledge, resources, and skills that we couldn't cover specific to them and their older adult. Each module has associated learning objectives that emphasize practical skills development. These objectives were created using Bloom's taxonomy of verbs and were specifically chosen to evaluate a caregiver's comprehension of the topic at hand, as well as their ability to evaluate and choose skills and utilize them for their older adults. This gives them practical skills that they're able to use moving forward in the future with the care of their older adult. We also have a question bank at the end of a module that can pull from a bank of questions to help assess the recall of the topics covered in the course curriculum. These questions are not meant to trip anybody up. They're simply meant to ensure that the time that they spent in the course content was well used and that they learned some of the topics that were discussed. In addition to the curriculum and the questions at the end, an associated workbook was developed that allows caregivers of older adults to chart their progress through the modules themselves, as well as to reflect on the content covered in courses. These workbook sections are meant to be followed alongside the course content sections and include questions that make learners consider the content that they learned throughout the module, as well as how it relates to their older adults specifically, like you can see here. Additionally, these workbook sections typically begin with a question along the lines of, what do you already know about this topic? And they end with, what did you learn about this topic? And how will you apply the skills that you learned in this module to taking care of your older adult? As I mentioned previously, um, adult learners, like the caregivers that we're targeting through our program, are more likely to respond well favorably to self-guided resources like these, which is partially why it was included. Additionally, as I mentioned in module eight, resources and referrals, um, these are in included throughout this module as well as some of the other modules as well. They're included for caregiver's benefit and touch on the key aspects that we discussed as being goals for our project overarchingly. They'll help them to address nutrition and food related concerns, such as making your own meal plan. Um, discuss how to find and utilize resources available to them, like in the exercise section and how to better access the medical system, like in a discussion on how to find a dietitian. Lastly, a part of this project included a production of a backend budgeting system that includes a break even analysis and. As it looks here, this is sort of a complex process, um, but I've broken it down and simplified it for the benefit of the seminar. So you can see here that each of the costs are variable based off of their units. So for example, both content management and graphic design are per hour units. So in the variable section to the bottom right, we have an estimated amount of hours that those costs might be needed for. Extrapolating content management hours is 20 and giving those hours, uh, the cost of the hours of around 40, which is um, sort of an industry standard for general content editing. will give a total cost, assuming that it's uh, more or less a one and done situation. Additionally, the platform costs a specific amount of money per year, depending on the tier at which you would like to subscribe to the platform itself as a host. Um, Marketing costs are another variable, which in, could include the cost of actually putting together advertisements, um, sending those advertisements out, email marketing campaigns, and graphic design related to creating those advertisements. 
Um, an additional cost would include video hosting fees, which are on a per month basis, the domain name, which is typically included in the platform costs, content updates, which are variable based on how frequent content changes are needed, as well as a payment processing fee on a per swipe basis. Um, these variables, as well as the costs are all editable and should hopefully add up and calculate a total cost per year value, uh, which with the assumed costs in this budget as it stands right now, give a total cost per user. So you can see here with the example amount of users being 300, um, with the total cost per year broken down as it is, the cost per individual user is $68.06, which is uh, more or less our break even point. Lastly, as we move into our conclusions, I just want to discuss some future directions for the geriatric nutrition school. This is just the beginning. The curriculum has only just been developed and drafted. It needs to be continued to work, uh, needs to be continually worked on until it's finalized. Eventually, at that point, the, the direction that the course goes will include creating video content uh, such that it can populate the online learning platform that we use. Additionally, we'll need to initiate marketing to attract a user base before releasing the course publicly, such that we can have a group of people who are already using it, who can maybe pilot the, or serve as a pilot cohort to provide feedback for how to improve the course in the future. Uh, one other thing that we could look for in the future is expanding audiences. Um, this might include nursing homes that uh, you could license out the course, excuse me, license out the course so that they could use it to help educate their caregivers specifically for helping the nutrition needs of their nursing home residents. We could also expand the content into different modalities to uh, target more specifically 65 and up older adults, like I discussed previously. There's even more things to be done too, but we just don't know what they are yet. Um, and then lastly, I would just like to acknowledge and thank both Katie Dodd and Julie McGuire as the members of my committee who helped me through this process, as well as all of the graduate program and human nutrition faculty and the faculty from my undergraduate degree for helping to prepare me as best as possible for the creation of this curriculum. I would also like to give a shout out, a huge shout out to PubMed and Zotero for helping keep me organized and without whom none of this curriculum could have even remotely been produced. Uh, and lastly, I would like to thank my family, my friends and my fellow students for keeping me motivated throughout the months of work on this project. I just wanted to say thank you all very, very much. Here is a list of my references. And now it's time for the Q&A session.